How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Ryan? Doing good. So I'm super excited to have you on the show. I, uh, so we've got a good, strong connection between my business partner, Brandon, and uh, you guys have known each other like pretty much your whole lives. And I know your brother, Joe, and him have been very, very close. And randomly, like, what was it, over the holidays, like a month ago, he's like, by the way, Joe's brother's got a lot of experience in this stuff. And I literally had no idea that you were involved in the actual bio of Joe. So it was just like super natural though. I'm like, okay, well, we got to get Matt on the show to hear the story. So here we are. Um, so for the, you know, you, you got an interesting career track, Matt, that like kind of led you up to how you were able to buy all safe and the, the structuring that you did. So maybe let's kick it back. Like, how did you decide to become an entrepreneur? Was it accidental? Did you intentionally do it? I know the first venture you guys went on or that you had was a super interesting one. Yeah, absolutely. Well, my background is in high tech and corporate finance. And uh, I, I got kind of the entrepreneurial bug at a young age, um, really being interested and excited about technology. And, uh, you know, I, I thought early on in my career that I wanted to be a technologist and somebody who was going to program computers and work with software and things like that. And I found out really quick that uh, I had an aptitude for finance, and I really liked dealing with people and working with people directly in a way that, you know, uh, maybe a, a technical career wasn't going to uh, uh, kind of suffice. So uh, I ended up, I was working at 3M. Uh, this was back, oh gosh, in the early 90s. And uh, I was working on some exciting technology there, and it got me thinking that there might be uh, an opportunity for me to get out and start my own business. And that's when I founded uh, Covex Corporation. Uh, I ended up getting a couple of patents there. The, the business uh, was in the semiconductor inspection industry. So we were doing data analytics and, and uh, surface uh, analysis for uh, various components that went into computers at the time. So uh, that's when I got my first taste of starting a business, running a business. And uh, you, raised, you raised money for that too, didn't you? That's right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We raised uh, about $3 million, I want to say. And uh, that was all from private angel financing at the time. Uh, I was lucky to have some really good mentors and was able to put together a, a board of directors uh real early in the process that were helpful in kind of guiding me on how to how to develop that initial capital raise and uh, really taught me a lot about, you know, what it means to have a startup in a high tech industry and, and get it kicked off from a capital structure perspective. So uh, that was quite a process. <laughs> I was going to say, well, and what you what you were doing in the tech space in the early 90s like that is was I was probably ahead of its time and like how do you go from wanting to you know you know work on the in the the computer space to to raising the money I mean like was it because sometimes people don't even understand that that's a possibility like what what connected the dots to the finance and to the capital raise like that well I think necessity to begin with you know this the technology that I was working on it required a pretty substantial investment just to get it off the ground. And in order to do that, I knew I was going to need some capital. So, you know, I started out like a lot of entrepreneurs scraped, you know, capital together. You get, you know, from your own savings account or from friends and family and, you know, the, you know, the story, I mean, you hear it all the time and, you know, that gets you a business plan and, and uh, you know, maybe proof of concept, but from there we needed some real money. And that, that that's where I started thinking about, okay, how do I do this and, you know, keep control of the company and, or at least, you know, be involved and, and also get the capital I need to get me the resources that I need in order to really, you know, build on my vision. So necessity was the driver there. So then what was the, the lifespan and the, the outcome of the first company like that? So that, that business was, in it was a, a total economic failure in the sense of business. <laughs> so you look at it and you say, wow, you know, we put all this time and energy into this thing and it blew up. The data storage industry didn't work in the uh, 
uh, late 90s, we were having a downturn. There was all this stuff, and I ended up exiting that business. But it was a total success in terms of the learning process, the, my partners that I had developed. Um, we, had, we licensed a little bit of that technology, and, and people walked away from it saying, wow, we learned a lot, and we want to do this again. So I ended up you know, going on to having a number of successful ventures after that. Uh, but, you know, failure uh, early in one's entrepreneurial career, I think, is something that's super important because you need to see see how difficult things can be in order to move on to the next thing. And it, it really puts things in perspective. So it was a, it was an interesting uh, first step in in my career path. What were some of the biggest things that you learned in the MBA of failure yeah, from that venture? Well, I, you know, in the high tech world, I learned, you know, not the best technology doesn't always win. It's, it's about, sometimes it's timing and luck. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, I was, I was really lucky to have a great board of directors, good capital structure. We didn't have great market timing. We had some other things go wrong. Uh, you know, development costs for early stage tech companies oftentimes are much larger than you originally anticipate. And you find out that, you know, what what you thought was going to happen isn't always uh, <laughs> what actually is going to happen. And, you know, we learned a lot about, I learned a lot specifically about how to really translate a vision into reality and what what's realistic and what isn't. I mean, that was one of the most valuable lessons that uh, I got out of that process. And, you know, downstream from there, I really applied a lot of those lessons to um, other businesses that I was involved in, which uh, led to, uh, you know, much larger successes, both economically, but also in terms of uh, personal growth and, you know, team development and that sort of thing. So what, what, you know, after you're licking your wounds, I mean, and that's a, it's a big, it's a big, you know, a big punch to the, to the ego and also the, the reality check, you know, what, what, what was the process and what did you end up doing next and how did you come up with your next venture? Well, so I, I went to work for a company in a, in a related industry that at the time it was called Applied EPI. It was a local technology company that was building uh, the machines that make the chips that go into cell phones. And this was back when 3G technology was brand new. So this is way before smartphones and, and, other things, you know, that was, you know, the early 2000s, like 99, 2001, mm -hmm. that sort of time frame. And I knew I wanted to be in tech, but I really wanted to stay on the on the deal side of things. So I went to work for these guys in corporate development and learned a lot about intellectual property management, um, raising capital to uh, start new businesses inside of a company. And uh, ultimately, that business was was uh, sold uh, to a company called Vico Instruments out of New York. So that was a, a, a really exciting and good process for me. And, you know, from there, I decided uh, I wanted to take a bit of a break uh, from working with other people, get back into my own uh, gig, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I thought about starting another company. I thought about, uh, uh, maybe just being a consultant for a time being, I felt like I had a lot of interesting experiences that I could share with others. And uh, that's how I got involved in uh, small lower middle market uh, M&A work. I was working with Sunbelt business brokers for a number of years. And my plan going into that was really to say, hey, I want to look at a number of different businesses. I think this is going to be a great opportunity for me to help people get into business and then finance the purchase of those businesses. And at the same time, I'm going to be able to see a lot of interesting opportunities. And who knows, maybe I'll buy one of these businesses. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, when I was working there, I actually got hired by uh, Windmark Corporation to help them with uh, some transactions they were working on at the time. And uh, that led to actually them hiring me to, to help work with a new startup that they were forming inside of their company. So that, that led to the next step in my, uh, my trajectory. So yeah, it was, a, uh, one, one little thread into the other one, huh? <laughs> That's uh, yeah, exactly. You know, and, 
it was it was interesting. It was a situation where uh, I actually never thought I would go back into you know the quote unquote corporate world working for another team, but I essentially had an offer I couldn't refuse, and and it was a team of people that I was excited about working with, and I went there to to form a, a finance business and uh, head up sales for that. Well, that uh, business and ultimately I became the VP GM of that, which, you know, that, that company is a publicly traded company that's had a lot of success in both the finance and franchising space. Well, and so I want to come back to that. And I'm just curious to go back uh, to when your Sunbelt experiences, how long were you there and how many deals did you look at? Cause it's in, in part of the underlying uh, reason for the question is I think a lot of the listeners who are owners that have not sold, like, Looking at deals right. is so important, even if you have no intentions of acquiring, even if you want to sell, because it's kind of like looking at houses on Zillow. So like, what were some of your, like, how long did you work there? How many deals did you look at? What were some of the big takeaways and why did you not buy a company versus, you know, going and working for Winmark? Yeah, no, great question. I, I saw hundreds of, of deals while I was at Sunbelt. I was there for about three and a half years from, you know, early, I think it was 2001 until about 04, 05, something along those lines. And uh, during that time, uh, you know, some belts a sell side, basically sell side, lower middle market business brokerage. So their job primarily is to work with sellers of businesses and to match them with buyers. So they represent the seller. So you get an inside look at a lot of different companies and, I worked initially on very small transactions and then ultimately scaled into larger lower middle market deals. And uh, I saw a swath of opportunities I mean, everything from software companies to convenience stores. I mean, you name mm -hmm. it because they were industry agnostic. So you see a lot of uh, different deals come ac across your desk. And um, one of the interesting things that, that they did there at Sunbelt and, and the owner of the Midwest region was he, he started a fund to invest in, uh, he would cherry pick certain deals that would come across the desk. You know, they'd offer it to uh, sellers and say, hey, if you wanted us to be involved in your, your buyout, we would be happy to do that. And uh, I was involved in that for a while and it really, it got me thinking you know, there's a lot of great opportunities here. And uh, I was actually in the middle of working on some of those investment projects when Winmark approached me and said, hey, we'd really like you to come on board and, and uh, help us with the startup. So I think I ultimately would have bought a business while being there. Uh, just the timing hadn't worked out up to that point. And then the offer you couldn't refuse, right? And be before we go to the well, market, right, I mean, <laughs> which in exactly. order to be doing something like that, I mean, that you're kind of making it's obviously pointing the to the North Star of like this has got to be the, the next logical thing. But before we go into the win mark and then kind of the the natural progression of the story, Matt, I, is you know for the listeners because I, I you know I've done I've talked a lot about brokers and investment bankers and the different spectrum and there there was a gal named Stephanie who just uh, was on that show. She sold her company for over like 55 million bucks didn't use either she had looked at both and she was in the weird what we like to call no man zone or in the no man's land and i'm just can you just right, right. i'm curious in your definition you're you're just because you're out of the industry your two cents on brokers investment bankers what is your definition of the lower middle market and, and just kind of you and we don't have to get too much into it i'm just curious because like so, there's so many a wide range of them and opinions about it well, absolutely. It's really two questions there. I mean, my, my opinion about it, it's not unlike the residential real estate industry in some ways. But there are a lot of business brokers, a lot of lower middle market uh, folks that'll tell you they understand how to buy and sell businesses. The reality is there's a small group of them that do it well, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, you know, so you, you have a lot of people that can get into that industry. Uh, some of them are dabbling. Some of them don't have a track record. Uh, you know, to your listeners, I would you know give them that advice that you really want to work with someone, whether you're uh, buying or selling. Mm -hmm. You want to work with somebody and a firm that has a strong track record of completing transactions in the market space that you're in, whether that means geographically or uh, industry-wise, because 
you know, there's so many people, for instance, you can sell your home with, right? But do you want to work with someone who's done this before and done it successfully and has maximized value and gotten the highest price if you're the seller or got you a great deal if you're a buyer? Or do you want to, you know, work with somebody who's, you know, never done it before? So uh, that selection process can be hard, uh, but it's really important up front. And then how about your definition then, of the, the the middle market and like the, the size that brokers have versus investment bankers and the different kind of skill sets of the two? Right. You know, and it, it's been a while since I've thought about that, where those cutoffs are. I can put it in perspective, you know, with the company that I run now, you know, businesses that are uh, below kind of that 4 million of EBITDA, I would say, are generally going to be in that lower middle market category. So, you know, at some point we used to have, I don't know, rough cutoffs of, you know, you've kind of got the small owner operator type of operation, which is, you know, your convenience store, single unit operator at the very low end. Maybe they're, you know, discretionary cash flow or, or modified EBITDA, we would call it, was somewhere in that $200,000 range. That's really mm-hmm. tiny, right? Mm-hmm. And then you get up into, you know, businesses that start to get into the next strata of maybe half a million to a million of EBITDA. You know, now you've got a, a little bit more substantial sized business, maybe maybe a, a layer of supervisors or professional managers that are starting to come together, uh, maybe some systems in place, but not really fully developed yet. And then you get kind of to that two to five million of EBITDA where you're, uh, you would expect those businesses to, they may not be sophisticated and fully developed from a professional management perspective, but they're getting close mm-hmm. and they're, you know, depending on how their position might be set up, you know, to do add on acquisitions or other things. So there's, uh, there's different ways to slice up that market, but that's kind of the, yeah. the spectrum of lower middle market in my mind, you know, once you get above that, I think you kind of get in mid market, you know, yep. levels and beyond. No, and I think it's, and, and I appreciate the, the the overview because I think it's just something that, you know, it just varies from opinion to opinion and brokerage to brokerage. And like you said, even like broker to broker. So I think it's just, it's, it, it can't be over discussed, I think for the listeners, because, you know, when they go to that, to that altar, you know, they got to pick the, pick the guide that actually works the best. And so it, it, moving on to, you know, to your win mark, I'm curious, like, you know, and we don't have to touch too much on, on this, but like the, you know, which is interesting because this is where you and I kind of have the overlap in the Venn diagram where, you know, you're doing equipment leasing and financing, which we were doing at Imaging Path, um, where you have to end up learning a bunch, of, even more about like juggling money and, and leasing and, and uh, all the numbers. How did, you know, what was the, what was your, the, the track record and the kind of your career at Winmark? And then how did you end up getting to the triggering point and maybe, and maybe kind of given a little bit of context of all safe and why you ended up going that direction? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was recruited to go to Winmark to head up sales for a startup lease finance division. So we were doing small ticket leasing. Uh, my job was to go out and build a, a revenue stream, a book of of business and you start with, you know, like any good sales process, you know, you're, you're working your network and you're getting out, figuring out how to access uh, the end user that needs small ticket finance. So we were doing transactions that were small ticket leasing is a high volume, low ticket type mm-hmm. of business. So you're doing, you know, transactions that are anywhere from 10,000 to all the way up to maybe 200,000 at the very largest. Her average ticket size was somewhere like 25,000 to $30,000, something like that. Mm-hmm. And um, the trick to that business is to build a volume of applicants that come in, typically small business owners, and getting to that market is historically been a challenge. You know, American Express has tried to do it, GE Capital has tried to do it. Uh, some of them have done it really well. Uh, some of them have gotten into that market and, and failed or never even been able to access the market. So given my experience with finding small business owners through Sunbelt and that sort of thing, mm-hmm. I was able to apply some of the, the techniques that, that uh, uh, I had used throughout my career to kind of market to that particular group of people. And, and we were very successful at it. We were able to, uh, we worked with a number of franchisees, a number of uh, 
small business owners in different industries in order to provide them financing. So that business started from uh, basically zero uh, and grew to a point where, you know, we were, we were generating, gosh, I, I want to say it was over $50 million a year in uh, application requests. So we didn't do all those deals, but that's the kind of volume that was yeah, wow. getting presented to us. Right. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, what, what, after the, you know, what was the, 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 um, the journey from Winmark to all safe? I mean, is what, and I don't know, I actually, I don't know if that was a direct um, journey, but like how, you know, at what point did your, did it kind of, you know, was the writing on the wall that it was time to switch gears or that you wanted to go back in and run your own company? Yeah, no, that, so a great question. The, uh, one mark was very successful and had uh, uh, gotten to a, a point where our cost of capital had risen and some things were changing in the marketplace. This was really during the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. Mm. I had decided that that business, I had a difference of opinion, let's say, with the CEO of that company about how to move forward. So I decided at that point that, hey, you know what, you've got a different vision for where this is going. Uh, I think there's a there's a certain way to weather the storm here uh, in, in, with what's going on in the industry and decided that since I wasn't going to be allowed to pursue that, uh, that I would head off and do something else. So uh, I was doing some due diligence on a number of different companies that happened to be tech-driven distributors or or just wholesale distributors that were in a couple of different industries. So that, that was an industry that or end markets, I should say, but that wholesaling was a, a business model that I was really interested in. Mm -hmm. And my brother, Joe, I asked him to do some due diligence work with me on an interesting deal. And the more we got to talk, the more uh, we kind of looked at each other and said, hey, why don't we work together? And we struck a deal where uh, I basically proposed to him, look, I'll come on board and work with you. We'll grow this business together with the understanding that I'm going to buy you out after a period of time. And that's what happened. So I came on board at Allsafe uh, to head up sales and marketing in 2009 and ended up buying a uh, majority stake in, in the business in 2013. And, you know, since then, you know, we've just had a really strong, tremendous growth story. Um, I think we've grown when I say my, my compound annual growth rate since 2009 here at the company is over 17% a year. So oh, it's, nice. it's pretty strong. Yeah. Yeah. And we've, we've been, you know, we've got really strong plans here going into the future too. So, you know, just this year or this last year, I should say 2018, um, I completed a, a recap of the business with a private equity firm out East that uh, has really positioned us nicely to, take advantage of uh, additional growth opportunities in this business. So we're, we're going to be growing both organically and through add-on acquisitions. And, well, and this know, is, I've got a vision to really grow this business, you know, nationally. So we're excited about that. Well, and that and that whole thing that you just gave the clip notes on is what we're going to unpack a little bit, because I think, you know, from, from the, the stories that I heard from Brandon, like it, it's, this is where I think a lot of listeners can, use a little bit of, you know, two cents of people that are doing it, what tools and mechanisms are available for them to do these kind of things. Because that was what you and I were talking about before we jumped on the show is that that was some of the stuff that I didn't know, I was not aware of, right? And that there's a lot of owners when they're running their business, they don't understand this kind of stuff. So they just don't explore it because they don't really understand that these are options. So maybe let's we'll start back from the, you know, when you, you say that you and your brother started talking, um, so what was the history of Allsafe and Joe working there and how did that whole negotiation actually come about? And like, what was some of the, 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 the outcomes of that negotiation? Right. Yeah, no, it was an interesting Genesis. So Joe got involved in, so, so maybe just quick background on Allsafe. Allsafe is, is a wholesale distributor and service provider of compressed gas equipment. So we do things like service and sell welding gas cylinders and valves and that sort of thing. And it's a, it's a very large industry, uh, somewhat fragmented throughout the U.S. and uh, uh, touches a lot of end-use markets. So everything from 
you know, beverage carbonation to welding gas to medical gases and alternative fuels. So there's lots and lots of end user applications for what we do. And uh, uh, Joe got involved in the industry when uh, he found out that his father-in-law uh, had been diagnosed with cancer. His father-in-law was the founder of All Safe, or one of the founders, way back in the the mid '70s. And this this business had been a small, relatively successful, but sleepy, you know, what you would consider a small business for many mm -hmm. years. And Mike, the founder, found out that he was sick, and was actually told he was going to die. And oh he went to my brother and said, "Hey." I want to work out an arrangement with you so that you can take over this business. And Joe was already a successful business owner himself. He uh, was running a concrete business at the time and doing really well. And this wasn't part of his plan or playbook, but life circumstances led him to buy this business from Mike. And as an aside here, the, it, it, it turns out to be a good news story for Mike. He miraculously a year later goes into remission his cancer disappears and he still works as a consultant for us today so um he does kid around with us and says you know gosh i really wish i wouldn't have sold that business we said well mike we're gonna count it as a win for you because you're alive <laughs> it all worked out in the end yeah right <laughs> so so then so i yeah. you know I, <laughs> well i was just gonna say that then i got to talking to joe about buying a company as i mentioned previously and uh, I really got intrigued by this industry because, you know, you think of compressed gas equipment, it's not very sexy, but at the, at the end of the day, there's some real fundamental opportunities in the industry. And uh, we've been doing a good job of kind of leveraging uh, uh, technology and bringing, you know, kind of a new skill set into what I would say is kind of an old school industry. So, all right. So, uh, so Joe buys out his father-in-law. Then, it, like, what kind of time frame goes out? And I, I don't know how they came up with some valuation. I'm sure there was a lot more emotions in that. Where, you know, how did you and Joe structure your partnership? And what kind of stuff did you have predetermined of what that whole arrangement was going to look like? Because I want to kind of go get all the way up to. I mean, because essentially you've been buying this for a return on investment. You've got a growth strategy. So I want to make sure that we totally jump into that. But I'm curious because a lot of these, a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, they get into these partnerships and they have stuff just happen. And then they just realize after the fact that they wish they would have structured things differently. The partnership, the valuation is different, you know, strategies. So I'm curious, especially, you know, negotiating with your brother, um, that's, there, there has to be <laughs> some challenges that went into that. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, he's probably got another version of the story, <laughs> but I'll tell you mine because he's not on the podcast today. <laughs> Joe's a great guy and he's, he's been a super successful businessman. And, uh, you know, I've had my successes as well leading into those negotiations. So <laughs> there were certainly times when we didn't see eye to eye on either how to structure things or how to, uh, even, you know, run the business post transaction. Cause him and I were partners uh, for a long time, but we saw, we saw things, uh, we were more alike than, uh, than not. And, you know, we're able to overcome those differences. But I would say getting into a deal, I mean, number one, you have to consider carefully whether or not you want to be in business with family. I mean, that does add a whole other dynamic, a whole layer of complexity, because obviously those family relationships are uh, important and you want to maintain those, but at the same time, you want to make good business decisions. And Joe's a pretty level-headed guy. Um, I like to think I'm a, a reasonable guy. And at the end of the day, you know, we, we were always able to come to, you know, a mutually respectful <laughs> resolution. But I will say going into the deal, um, I had my heart set on and my mind set on, I'm going to buy this business. Mm -hmm. And I was clear with him about that. So it wasn't, hey, let's be 50-50 partners forever or let's, you know, have some other arrangement. It was, we're going to grow this and I'm going to acquire a controlling interest in the business. So he remains a shareholder today, but he's a minority shareholder. And um, I wanted it that way because I wanted, I wanted clear direction, clear, uh, I wanted focus on mm -hmm. who was in charge, what the plan was going to be, and how we were going to move ahead. And for us, that worked out really good. So prior to me acquiring the company, but him and I working together, he was in charge. 
Mm-hmm. And post-transaction, I was in charge. And I wanted that real clear delineation. And that doesn't work for everybody, I'm sure. But for us, um, you know, I just, I think it, it made sense because we're, we're both uh, drivers. We both have visions. Our visions were aligned, but I would say that our methods sometimes are different. So mm-hmm. uh, that was important going into the transaction. As far as negotiating price in terms of the deal, obviously I had had a lot of experience with negotiating M&A deals coming into this because I had done that both, uh, well, a lot of time spent at Sunbelt doing that. That was my job. But then also on the corporate finance side, you know, licensing technology or mm-hmm. looking at acquisitions, whether it be, you know, with Applied EPI or other other companies that I worked with. So um, I took that approach and said, hey, look, here's, here's what I know about valuing a business. Here's what I think is reasonable. He had his own ideas about <laughs> uh, what, you know, what made sense. And we were able to... I would say do some structuring, I would call it, from a corporate finance standpoint, meaning, you know, he took some notes back. Um, there was some seller financing in the deal a little bit, but I, there was important to him that he had a certain amount of cash, you know, in closing. So I was able to arrange for that. Um, right. And, and then that came from both equity and debt partners. So there was a there was a capital stack, I would call it, that really got him to the price that he wanted and me the price and terms that I needed to be a comfortable buyer. Well, and if you, and, and that's what I want to um, actually peel apart because I think that's what a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs are not as aware of that there's mechanics that you can get, you know, through negotiation and structuring that can get a lot of, you know, through creativity, you can get people kind of what they want. And I'm curious, Matt, did, so if you came on in 09 and then you bought them out in 2013, did you in 09, because I think a lot of families uh, families struggle with this or, you know, owners who hire, you know, run and gun and, you know, second in command who are sales were like, did you have all that determined in 09 when you came on predetermined price, deal structure, that kind of stuff? Because I think the big challenge that so many people have is, okay, so I'm going to grow your company and then I'm going to buy my growth back from you. So that doesn't make any sense, right? So like, how, how did that work when you came on board and then when you got to the, the closing? Well, there was two parts. Uh, yeah, it's a really great point you're making. And there was, a, there was a fuzzy part to the deal, the part that wasn't solidified and then needed to be fleshed out in, you know, basically 2012, 2013, you know, leading up to the, the acquisition. And then there was a, a concrete part of our arrangement. The concrete part involved me coming on board and getting some equity right away. I said, look, I want, I'm want i going to help you grow this. I want to participate in the upside of this business regardless of what we end up with as a final transaction. Now, mm-hmm. we did talk generally up front about valuations, uh, where we thought this was headed, what, you know, what the exit plan might be, and kind of what the number was in his head that was going to get us there and what we would need to achieve in order to justify that from my perspective as a buyer. So mm-hmm. I would say we agreed on a methodology going into it more so than a specific, okay. you know, purchase price and a specific set of terms. We had a range. We, we knew the transaction would be in a certain range and, and we were in that range at the end. And we knew that there'd be some parts of it that would have to get negotiated and structured at the time. Uh, so, uh, and I felt comfortable entering into that arrangement because I also had equity in the business, uh, a minority stake, you know, out of the shoot, and uh, I had confidence in my own ability to grow it. So, you know, with those yep, two yep. things together, um, you know, and the third piece is I trust my brother too. I mean, every business relationship, whether it's with family or not, requires a high level of trust, mm-hmm. and the. I think that level of trust is commensurate with the level of risk that people take, right? I mean, I, I trusted him a lot. So there was maybe a little bit more risk in the deal that I did uh, that I maybe wouldn't have done. I, I definitely wouldn't have done if he wasn't my brother. Uh, but still, that can be structured in order to accommodate for that. So, uh, and I saw lots of transactions like that when I was at Sunbelt. You know, we we had right. to put deals together, and the way we got paid as brokers was to make deals happen. So you had to find a way 
to bridge those types of price and structural gaps. Well, and what so, and I want to get into that because then how you structured it too, and how you get the, the creative things you guys did. But I, I also think that you know there's a lot of trust in relationships. But then if there's very unclear expectations and the details are fuzzy, that's when even the the closest relationships will have a nuclear bomb go off because they don't know what they don't know. So then people just go back to, you know, self survival mode, which is what I see happen every day with families and, um, and other partnerships. But so like, did you have to put any capital into the business right away or in like, so that's the first part of the question. The second part is when you said that you were comfortable with what you got with the methodology that you guys are going to be doing for growth, was there like, you know, certain things you guys discussed about capital that was going to be, you know, used to invest in the business to, you know, for you to want to buy a business, there's got to be certain things that you wanted to be done. So like, what was, what was the kind of the, the strategy there? Yeah, right. Well, as far as the initial structure getting into it, um, I, I was coming away from a, a, a pretty successful situation previous to uh, All Safe. So I took a, I took a pay cut you know, my salary, my base compensation in order to get into the business. And uh, Joe recognized that. And that was kind of a trade-off, you know, between me bringing my skill set and my business development background Mm -hmm. into the business. He saw value in that and was willing to give essentially some equity to me for doing that. And I took it, uh, you know, I took that pay cut in order to help finance that essentially. So, cause I believe that my ability to grow the business, I knew that that equity was going to be valuable downstream. And I also knew there'd be more current earning potentials as we grew the business. So mm-hmm. that was kind of the initial, you know, mindset between the two of us is, Hey, I'm going to risk some things here. He's going to risk some things. We're going to come to an arrangement, a financial and equity arrangement that makes sense for both of us. And I, I think that you know, ended up paying off, uh, you know, the deal wasn't perfect. Not everything worked out exactly the way we had originally anticipated, but, you know, I think there was, there was a substantial economic upside in it for both of us. And we're, we're continuing to realize that today, you know, I'm, awesome. I'm currently still the, the CEO of that business. So then how, like, well, cause I, I want to, when you talk about the capital stack and like how, how that all works, Maybe if if you can give the mechanics of how you guys did that, because I think it's super interesting. And then, because you have how you bought out Joe, right? And then, because then you also recapped it with another PE firm. So I'm just like, give maybe some, I mean, as as much detail as you want on how you went through that to bridge the gap of what Joe wanted up front, how you, you know, like, I think it was it mezzanine financing that you found or whatever it was. Like, I'm curious, like, what was the actual mechanics of what you, what the, what the deal structures that you put together? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the initial structure, meaning in 2013, when I acquired the yep. business was a capital stack that included, I had brought in a, a small minority equity partner, meaning small meaning they accounted for about 10% of the total purchase price. So they, they put in a small amount of equity. These were folks that I had business experience with previously. I had rolled my equity. So I had I got equity when I came into the business. I had earned that. It was valuable. Rather than cashing out, I left it in the company. So between the money that I left in and the small equity investment that I brought in, that was kind of the equity base. So mm-hmm. if you're thinking of it as a layered cake or that capital stack, that equity, you know, is your foundation. And uh, that's where I started. And then and from Joe there, Lesson. we layered on some senior debt and some mezzanine debt and then seller debt in this particular case. So in, and Joe left some in equity into, right? That's true. Yes. Yep. Yeah. He didn't completely exit the business. So that, that's a really good point. Joe left equity in there as well in a, a meaningful amount. And can you, can you explain for the listeners um, maybe each of those different layers and what they mean in, in terms of the deal structure. Cause I've, you know, I've had people on the podcast that are, that represent different layers of it, but I think coming from like the whole cake, like you're describing it and what the purpose was in the deal structure would be awesome. Yeah. And you know, I will say too, for our size and at the time, anyways, this is, was an unusually complex capital stack or financial (laughs) structure. So, uh, now that that's mainly a function of the fact that I was very comfortable with 
more complex financial structures coming into it because I have I'd had a lot of experience with that in the past. So uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily advocating complexity. It just happened to work in our case. And you know, there's a lot of different tools in the toolkit to get these kinds of deals done. And I think that's the takeaway. So whether it's, and I can walk you through that step, but yeah. whether it's senior debt, mezzanine debt, we also had a warrant in our deal with a put option, which is highly unusual for a, a lower middle market transaction, but it, it worked to bridge a gap because there was a, he wanted to, he wanted a premium on the price. In my view, he would argue that it wasn't a premium, but the, the point being is there was a value gap, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> this is where there are some differences. Well, so the, that's the that real one, world. How do you bridge that? Right. right? right. Well, and like, so, you know, the, yeah, go for it. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was yeah. just going to say, no, go I, I, think, I think it's awesome, Matt. And like, I, I know you, 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 it might be like kind of drinking water for you, but I think, you know, like the stuff that you just described that I, that you're going to, that you're going to dive into is, I mean, it is stuff that's happening, you know, at the, at the top level of investment banking, right? I mean, it's getting deals done through crazy different tools, but most people like, honestly, Matt, it's like, there's an SBA loan. Great. Or there's cash. <laughs> or there's an earnout, right? I mean, they're, 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 and even those are, you know, people slowly understanding that. And then there's PE recaps. And so there, there's this building block of knowledge that people are getting. And I think, you know, showing what's possible and then also, you know, explaining what, what pressures came after that, I think is important, but I, I absolutely dive into them because I think it's, uh, even though it might be unusual, I think it's interesting giving an explanation of the different tools and why that, why you used them. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm happy to, to share that. And, and you're right that if there's a takeaway from, from the complexity, it's that there are various flavors, you know, out there of financing that are available to people at different stages. It depends on the size of the deal. Um, you know, at, at the time, uh, you know, this was, uh, you know, in the millions, double digits, sort of size wise. So it, it made sense to have a little bit of additional complexity. And, um, you know, I was able to bring some of those tools to bear. So when you think about the different pieces, the, you know, the, the equity part of the deal um, generally comes in two flavors. There's common equity and there's preferred equity. We kept everything fairly simple at that equity layer. It was all common equity. So everybody who was uh, a shareholder in the transaction had the same rights. And that, you know, whether it came to voting rights or economic distributions downstream, that sort of thing. So it was plain vanilla equity um, to begin with. Mm -hmm. You can make that more complex, and that's probably a whole other conversation, yeah, but uh, yeah. th there are things you can do at that level. But then I started to look at different types of debt that I could use, um, and debt works well in certain circumstances. All safe is a strong business with repeatable cash flows. We have recurring revenue sources, uh, a relatively high margin. So you can support uh, relatively high debt loads compared to other types mm -hmm. of businesses that maybe your cash flows really won't be. You know, if you're a capital equipment manufacturer or something like that, and you, you sell two pieces of equipment a year, you might make a lot of money, but you you might not have a flow type of business. And that doesn't work as well with large amounts of debt. So in this case, it made sense to layer some debt on the deal and an appropriate amount of debt you know, people will say it's anywhere from, you know, three to five turns of debt or three to five times your free cash flow is an amount of debt that you can, you know, put in a business of this size. And it, it depends on other aspects of the structure, but mm -hmm. that's a general guideline. And that, so when you think about that debt piece, now you want to, you want the lowest cost of debt, of course, which is going to be senior debt. Uh, and a senior lender is, uh, a commercial banker typically kind of like you would get with an SBA loan. Mm -hmm. In this case, though, it was not SBA. This was, so it's going to be a little more expensive because you don't have the government guarantee of an SBA loan. Mm -hmm. Was it just a conventional um, loan then? What's that? Was it just a normal conventional loan? These, yeah, it was a, it was a revolving credit loan along with a term note. So yeah, it was basically conventional amortized debt. Mm -hmm. um, on a com 
a commercial level debt. So in that case, you're talking about now that there is no personal guarantees involved and no government guarantees involved. So you're going to pay a higher interest rate for that because from the bank's perspective, it's a, it's riskier than Mm -hmm. a fully secured loan, but we were able to get that type of financing because our business cash flowed really strong. And there's only certain lenders that are willing to do cash flow deals like that. So it's important to think, you know, talk to your lenders, the various lenders that are out there and understand what type of banker you're working with. Yeah. Cause they're not all the same. <laughs> there, you know, there are senior lenders that do cash flow loans like this yep. and there are a lot of them that don't. Mm-hmm. So that's the senior level tranche we'll call it or layer just to, you know, we, we could drill into any of these, but the next level is high yield debt or mezzanine debt. And the reason we needed to mix in some of that into this deal in addition to the senior debt is that the senior lender is only willing to go so far. Mm-hmm. They're going to, because it's a cash flow based loan, meaning they're lending more money than the assets that are guaranteeing the loan mm-hmm. would support, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, they're willing to do that, but up to a point. And they have a first secured interest in certain assets of the business, that sort of thing, typically. And then you get into uh, the mezzanine tranche where those folks are, they're generally, they, they play a little bit more like equity. They dig a little deeper into the business. They do higher levels of due diligence. They take more risk and they charge higher interest rates, interest yep. rates that are much higher than senior lenders. But it's not as expensive as giving up equity yep. in the long run. Yep. So it's another layer to that cake, right? And yep. then, you know, the these are kind of in reverse order of of risk of yeah. subordination, yep. meaning yep. the senior debt holder has the least amount of risk. If there's something goes wrong with the business, the senior debt holder is going to get their money back before everybody. Mm-hmm. Okay. The next in line is your subordinated debt holders, and then the next in line is any seller financing because that's typically subordinated to the mez. And then the next in line after that is your equity partners. Yep. So either, you know, preferred equity would be first and then common equity is at the very bottom. So usually the entrepreneur is at that common equity layer or level. So you got to believe in your capital stack. You got to, <laughs> right. you got to make sure everybody else gets paid. <laughs> Otherwise you're not going to see. Yeah. Return. You think you own your business, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So I'm curious, man, like, you know, aligning all these stars, which is so like, is interesting. Did you have any pushback from, and like, cause even going down to the seller financing that Joe or anybody else did, you know, like you can, you know, write some crazy contracts and the terms and conditions. So like you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen that, you know, need you to succeed. Did you have it, but they also have to agree that there's that many cooks in the kitchen. Did you have any issues with the senior debtors, uh, the commercial banks, you know, knowing that you were putting MES financing, seller financing on top of this? It, you have you have these things called intercreditor arrangements or agreements. And the intercreditors are really the written agreements. They're legal contracts between these various lenders. So all that has to be negotiated and managed. And that's why it's really important to pick lending partners that play well together. Typically, a senior lender can refer you to mezzanine lenders or vice versa that they've done deals with before. So Mm -hmm. from a process perspective, that can make things a lot easier. In our case, we actually got introduced to our mezzanine lender before we met our senior lender. And the mezzanine lender said, hey, have you thought about working with these guys uh, for your senior debt? Because they understand mezzanine, they work really well together, we know them, we've done deals, you know, we know how their contract negotiations are going to go, that sort of thing. And that can be very helpful. So if you can key in on one or the other, Mm -hmm. they can usually refer you into uh, the other, other layers of the capital stack. And then of course I had to negotiate with the seller in this case, my brother (laughs) to, you know, make that work. Right. Because he was going to be at the bottom of that stack and taking the most <laughs> risk from a debt perspective. Now, you know, he, for him though, there was a balancing act. 
he was both at the bottom of the stack and at the top of the stack at the closing because he's getting cash, right? Right. He's taking a chunk of that purchase price off the table to kind of lock in his his gain. So, you know, he was willing to balance that out by saying, okay, I'm taking a certain money certain amount of money off the table here i'm willing to take some risk on the other end of this in order to make the deal happen yep yep and and so which you know like if, based on all the other interviews i've done it's like it's just you got your uh, you kind of hit your your target nut to to crack when you do that and then the rest is you know it's like you said you're getting paid for the risk and um so Matt, for you, it's like, okay, so I, I'm just getting flashbacks of my old capital structure <laughs> and the, the, the challenges of making sure you're, you're, you know, paying all these people. What was your mentality in, in your, you know, your, where was your head at? It's like, okay, like, yeah, I don't know how much, you know, razor thin margins you had to, to make sure that you were paying all these people and having capital to invest in the business to grow. So what was your strategy to pay these people off and then continue to grow? And how did you, and what was your comfort level? Yeah, no, it's a, a great question. And out of the gate, I would say, I mean, the strategy, the strategy was there was still enough cash flow left over to reinvest in the business um, year one so that we could continue to grow. Because my goal going into it was growth mode. You know, mm-hmm. I, I am a growth entrepreneur. I'm, my mindset, my skill set is designed toward and direction that business development and you know getting new customers gaining market share building the business and that was always the mindset going into it and not every entrepreneur is that way some people are looking for more of a lifestyle business mm-hmm. or they're looking for you know some other arrangement but that wasn't my view going into this you know I, i'm a growth ceo and uh, knowing that about myself and about the prospects of the business, I had to design the capital structure to allow for enough dry powder to grow the company. Now, yep. even the best laid plans, you know, can sometimes go awry. And I'll tell you <laughs> that first 18 months out of the gate, we ended up, we, one of our key product lines ended up having some problems. And oh, we yeah. were uh, not generating quite as much cash flow as we had projected. So everybody was getting paid and that wasn't a problem, Uh, but there wasn't as much growth capital as I had originally thought Mm -hmm. there'd be in the business. So we had to slog through that to rebuild parts of the business to generate that uh, additional cash flow to then reinvest back into the business. And Mm -hmm. then subsequently, just this uh, this last fall here in uh, September, 2018, I ended up recapitalizing the business again to provide even more growth capital for the company. So I brought in equity partners to take out some of that debt, which had now been paid down partially and, and so on and so forth. So there was a different calculus that went into that transaction. And uh, uh, I have a lot of dry powder now in order to both grow organically and through acquisition. So, and we, and we grew along the way. So it was, this has been a successful growth story under different capital structures, but always with an eye toward making sure there was some cushion because you have to have cushion, particularly if you're going to layer in debt into a deal. And, and arguably at one point or another, we were a little bit over levered. So you feel uncomfortable <laughs> when that is happening. I mean, you, you and I have talked about that, right? Yeah. <laughs> uncomfortable is a good adjective, I think. Slightly right, right. You know, a couple of cocktails. Right, right. exactly. <laughs> yeah. You'd like to avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so Matt, like, um, you know, maybe sharing with the the listeners. Okay, so now you're, you know, you you when you bought that from Joe and you're, you're marching towards first 18 months and then you, you know, you, you uh, recapitalize um, the business, you know, in a nutshell, that's refinancing, right? So you've got high, you've got senior debt, high yield debt, seller financing and all this stuff like, and explain to the list. Cause when Brandon had told me, this is why I was excited to have like, you know, this whole story on the show is because like, 
it, there's so most people don't realize there's 6,000 private equity firms, right? So you've seen one, you've seen one because everybody has different needs, wants, what they're willing to do, not do majority, minority, all that kind of stuff. So what were you looking for in that, in this partner? What did they provide you? What was the process you went through to go to find them? And then how did that actually impact like your, your, your debt structure? I mean, like as far as like how much, you know, additional room you had. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you're right. There's a lot of different types of PE firms and, and investment firms out there, just like there are lenders. So it's, it's important, you know, at, at the surface, lenders all look the same, right? Well, they, you know, they lend money and they collateralize it, right? That's how it works. Well, when you really dig down where the rubber meets the road, you find out that there are huge differences, not only in, in lenders, but with PE firms. So no. uh, that, that's a great, important point. The criteria that I used um, when looking for a partner uh, to do my recap was I was primarily looking to achieve two things. One, to align myself with a group that has significantly larger amounts of capital that would allow me to do add-on acquisitions because there's a huge growth opportunity in my industry to do that. Mm -hmm. So I want to take advantage of that. And the best way to do that was to bring in equity partners with deeper pockets. So mm -hmm. that was important to me because as, as successful as all the safe has been and as much cash flow as it spins off, it's still not enough to do to roll out a, a rapid acquisition strategy, you know, over let's say a five year time horizon. So you need outside capital to do that is the point. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a, an important criteria. Maybe the most important criteria is you have to like the people you're going to be working with. I know that sounds kind of, you know, <laughs> uh, maybe simple, but you're going to meet a lot of people when you talk to these private equity firms that you don't like these people and they don't, maybe they don't like you. And you know what? <laughs> We're not going to work well together. I don't want to spend the next five, you know, going to board meetings and talking to people uh, that I don't like to work with. So it was really important for me to get to know the teams. And I interviewed, uh, I hired, this time I hired an investment banker, a small investment banker, actually out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that did a great job for us. And they looked at, a combination of mezzanine lenders and PE funds that did the type of deal that mm. I wanted to do. Uh, so they helped me narrow the universe down. So that made sense, you know, in our case with our, with our scale. And of course you pay them a fee to do that. And you know, that, that was well worth it. I'm, I'm a big believer in using intermediaries when they're good and right. they know what they're doing and, and you've got a targeted vision and a set of criteria. Mm. And, so and, uh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and, one of the things that, and I, maybe you're going to just say it, but was it majority stake or minority stake that the that the PE firm bought? Well, in this case, it, it was. It's interesting. It's a layered cake of equity, so <laughs> it's kind of a shared <laughs> control deal. <laughs> so just, a, a whole other discussion about the, the layer of complexity there. But early on, the economic it's a preferred equity deal, so the economic returns are weighted toward the the invest the PE firm. Uh, that came into the deal, they're going to get a certain preferred return before the common equity holders get theirs. Uh, but when it comes to managing the company and and operations and things like that, uh, I retain control in that sense. So it's a it's a bit more complicated than just you know majority or minority. But that's another way you know you can structure deals in order to get everybody what they need, right? So in this case, you know, I found a partner that, you know, met some of the criteria I've already mentioned, but they, they were also put enough capital in initially in order to basically take out an additional chunk of debt, you know, beyond what we had already paid down in order to free up current cash flow. So I not only have current cash flow that I can reinvest now, but I also have a partner with deep pockets that can help us do add-on acquisitions. So then did it actually free up? You're actually like, so did you actually like, you know, refinance everything? So, or do you still have like the same annual payment, like debt service payments? The debt service payments change completely. So um, my, uh, we still work with, we actually switched. We still have a lender, a senior lender in the deal. There's no more mezzanine financing. So there's just a senior lender and 
preferred and common equity. So we simplified the cap structure, which was another one of my goals, because uh, the complexity of the previous, <coughs> excuse me, cap structure worked well at the time. But in order to achieve what I want to do now for the next stage of growth, it, it made sense to simplify things. Mm-hmm. And the payments went down substantially, <laughs> uh, but that comes at a cost. We had to give up a, a, a meaningful chunk of equity to get there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, which I think, you know, the moral of that whole story is like, you know, like you can, it, so many people, Matt, don't understand kind of what you've gone through and, but it's just, it's like trying to build a house with like one tool belt instead of an entire enclosed trailer, like you need. <laughs> and you know what I mean? And, that, and I just, right, right. <laughs> people don't know what all the tools are that are available to them. And it, so with, with the, the eye on the, on the future, Matt, like what is the, what are the big things that you're accomplishing? You know, if you got any like secrets to the, you know, with the growth entrepreneur that you are, that you're trying to accomplish the things that are working well, what's kind of the, what's the strategy for the pedal to the metal? Right. Well, you know, we're having just completed this recap. I'm, uh, we finished up, you know, 2018 really strong and uh, we're positioned really well now to both, to both grow organically and through acquisition. And really the vision for Allsafe is to bring it from, we're primarily a regional player now from the services perspective that we provide. We want to take that and grow it nationally, coast to coast and become a premier servicer and wholesale distributor for the, the larger and mid-sized customers that are in this gas industry. So part of what I'm doing now is I'm on the hunt for investment opportunities, acquisitions, and we're investing internally in building out our sales force, um, entering new markets, both geographically and end user, because there's a lot of uh, opportunity to both add product lines and, and get into new markets, uh, depending on, you know, the, the part of the country that you're talking in about. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're, we're in a really good position to take advantage of that right now. And the economy is really strong. So there's demand for various types of uh, products and services in our industry. So, uh, you know, timing is important. And I want to take advantage of that here while, while things are are going good. You know, as far as uh, kind of words of wisdom on the growth side and being a growth CEO, I mean, you know, one of the things I'm always uh, thinking about is how to connect the vision of what I want, you know, the, the strategy and the long-term vision to day-to-day actions. That's, uh, you know, hard to do. And it's even harder to, I think, communicate that. But I, I look at, you know, one of my primary roles is coaching people, my, my team, to help them understand how their day-to-day actions play a role in that bigger vision. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, connecting those dots is just so key to having any organization, you know, be successful in the long run. You, you know, we all get up in the morning and, you know, we, we have our routine and we do what we do. And it's important to have those big goals, those long-term visions, and to know that, hey, what I'm doing right now is leading towards that. And, here, and here's how. Here's how those things are connected. So I spent a lot of time thinking about that. It's important, man, because like it, it makes it all worth it, right? There's context to why you're doing what you're doing. It makes things fun. <laughs> it's like super important. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's a lot more fun if you, you know, are focused on, <laughs> on getting somewhere. <laughs> well, sure. makes, it gives yeah, you right? direction. <laughs> That's well, you, right. That's right. You can you can take the punches during the day because you know <laughs> there's a reason for them. Uh, it's it, worth it. It's worth <laughs> it. Exactly. <laughs> Matt, if there's a if there's one thing you know, maybe maybe for anybody that's in your industry that is looking to you know potentially sell to someone like yourself, any words of wisdom for you uh, or for them, and the ways to contact you. I mean, because I think this. Uh, lends a, a, a big light into, and I, and I want to make, make sure you can use this, that like how you, how you look at things. Is there anything that you want to put out to, to the world? Oh, sure. Sure. Well, you know, from a, you know, when we're looking at opportunities and looking at companies, it's, it's important that they understand their numbers and have, have good accounting. You know, we're, uh, we're at a stage in, in a, of growth where, 
it's difficult for us to invest in a company that where we have to come in and build out a bunch of, you know, we have to do a bunch of blocking and tackling or a bunch of infrastructure, Mm -hmm. basic infrastructure. So I would say anybody at any size, if you're thinking about selling your business to, to anybody, you make yourself more marketable if you have a good set of financial statements that you can provide to people. And they don't have to be complex, but they have to be understandable. And they, you know, having them prepared by an outside accountant is helpful. Um, Sometimes that costs money and entrepreneurs, you know, it always costs money, but they don't necessarily want to do it depending on the stage of, or the size of their company, but it can be a really important investment. So, you know, we, I look for that. I mean, cause otherwise I have to flip over a lot of rocks just to figure out what the cash flow of the business is. And if, mm-hmm. if that becomes too cumbersome, it kind of takes the opportunity out of it or, or I end up discounting the deal so that, you know, now the seller isn't feeling as good about the price they're getting. Ridiculous. So that's a, that's an important nugget. Yeah. Yeah. Ridiculous you know, as, as far as reaching out to me, I mean, you can find me on LinkedIn, you know, the, my profile, uh, it's M Bettner, M B O E T T N E R, and there's ways to contact me there. Matt, this has been a blast, man. I really appreciate the uh, the creative words to wisdom. Well, I hope uh, I hope your listeners find it uh, useful and helpful, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity, Ryan. It's been great to chat with you and and uh, get to know you. So this this has been great.